A happy Easter to you all. I am David Scare. Um, I teach in the area of Lutheran dogmatics and uh, New Testament, specifically the Gospels, the, the Synoptic Gospels. And um, but it will not be a Synoptic Gospel that we do for the fifth Sunday in Easter. We'll combine. Uh, we'll do this in one session. Of course, it can be divided as you get a hold of it. The Gospel for Easter 5 and Easter 6. And we'll read it in English and then we'll study it in Greek and the Greek will be on the board in the back of me. Jesus said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no more. Again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of the disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us, A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he means. Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while? And you will not see me. And again, a little while, you will see me. Truly I say to you, You will... You will weep and lament. The world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. When a woman is in travail, she has sorrow, but when her hour is come, because her hour is come, but when she is delivered of the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for it, joy that a child is born into the world. So you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This particular gospel uh, has been open to many interpretations of um, what, what are the things that Jesus has to say? Uh, what does it mean that the spirit of truth comes? What does it mean that he will guide you into all truth? He'll not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine. Uh, this really is a sermon. On the, that uh, This is the material for a sermon that could really be believed on Trinity Sunday. Because our Trinity Sunday, ser our Trinity ser Sunday sermons are generally reserved, our Trinity sermons are generally reserved for Trinity Sunday, uh, when most of our congregations uh, can follow along to the first half of the Athanasian Creed and begin to stumble along and die out to the second column. In the way we preach, it might be said that we have a Jesus religion that limits itself uh, to Christ dying on Good Friday. I mean, that's the standard law gospel sermon that Jesus was nailed to a cross, died for our sins, so that we could, uh, so that we can uh, be forgiven. But there is something here, um, much more significant, uh, profound, that's taking place behind the calamity of Golgotha. Uh, the passage says that the Spirit will lead you into all truth. I'll stand up here. He will, here's the word hadas, hagaho, to lead. He will lead you into all truth. And he will announce to you the things that are about to come. Now this has allowed all kinds of fanatical opinions uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be introduced. That fanatics come along promising or claiming that they can look into uh, the future. And uh, that might be a, 
one way in which to uh, begin the sermon. Because one thing that really attracts people is the National Enquirer attitude towards life. Uh, that uh, they have to find the most fantastic thing to put on the front cover. And it's always great to have a prophet who is going to make a prediction about the future. The people will flock to this kind of an individual. And in each generation, someone claims to do that. The Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, other people have predicted uh, the end of the world, the Anabaptists in the time of Luther did that. And to begin a sermon like that will uh, attract a lot of attention or keep the attention. Uh, however, th uh, this passage here um, um, pretty much tells you what Jesus is referring to. And that is this, that um, he is speaking before his death. And he is telling you, uh, he is, he's telling us uh, what, his, what his teachings are. He speaks about uh, the Spirit leading them into all truth. It is not that the Spirit is going to tell, the Holy Spirit is going to tell them things which they have not heard about. But um, the Spirit is going to take the teachings of Jesus, the words of Jesus, and to put them on a higher level. Um, and it tells you how the Holy Spirit works. And take a look at verse 14. Uh, he will, that one, that one will glorify me because, and this really is the crux of the passage, because he will take, he, from, my, from mine he will take and he will announce them to you. Now, with this point, we are getting into the inner mysteries of the, uh, of the entire trinity. Now, uh, you already know that uh, the Eastern Orthodox and the Calvinists allow for a working of the Holy Spirit apart from Jesus. The uh, Eastern Orthodox do not believe in the filioqua, that, he that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, but that the Spirit can go out into the world. Roman Catholics tend to do that too. And that is, this is the question. Uh, can the Spirit go, can the Spirit work apart from the message of the Gospel? Well, the, tri the entire Godhead, the triune God, uh, is, is a, can be found in nature throughout, uh, throughout the world. Uh, that's the natural knowledge of God. But that's not the subject here. Uh, the subject here is the spirit who is attached to Jesus. There is, no, it's, there is no such possibility that one person of the Trinity can work without the other. And it says here that the spirit will take from me and will declare it to you. Now, the spirit, in a certain sense, in a real sense, in an actual sense, is imprisoned in the words of Jesus. He has no autonomous or independent existence. He does not invent things of himself. He takes the things that belong to Jesus. Now, when it says here that he will take the things of mine, right over here, he'll, he will take the things of mine, he is he's not referring only to the relationship of the Son to the Father, take the things of mine, but he's referring specifically to the earthly teachings and activities of Jesus. Uh, not only Jesus is God, but Jesus is man. The things that Jesus taught in the Gospel. Now, here, by including these words, uh, the evangelist is referring to what he himself has written in this Gospel. Now, this is the gospel is obviously written after the death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. So he's writing, he's writing from, a, he's looking backwards at what Jesus had said. And so he's referring to something that Jesus was going to talk about. And then he does something else here. Look in verse 15. 
He says, Ponte Hassa, all that the Father has is mine. Now that's an amazing statement. Um, it almost looks as if there's a, that was taken from the end of the Gospel of Matthew, well, teaching them to observe all things, Ponte Hassa, all things whatsoever I taught you. Uh, on that account, I speak not from myself and announce them to you. So there is, an, there's a, there is a subordination within the Trinity. The, sin, the, the Spirit gets, uh, it derives his essence, his life, and his activity from, from Jesus, the Son. And the Son uh, derives his, person, his personhood, his tasks, the activities which he does from the Father. And that has to be kept in mind. Um, uh, I've been to enough, at least I've heard enough, prayers offered in civic situations and even in non-civic situations where the prayer uh, to the reference of Jesus is, referen is, completely, is completely omitted. And there is no knowledge of God apart from Jesus. There is absolutely no knowledge. Now the other phrase that pops up here that is um, noteworthy is the word a little while. I think that phrase appears four times. Yes, the word mikran in verse 18. A little while. A little while you will not see me. A little while you, that's in verse 17. You will see me. Verse 18, what does he mean, a little while? And uh, then Jesus asked them in verse 19, is this is what you are asking among yourselves, what I mean by saying a little while? In a little while you will see me. Now that really could be the entire focus of a sermon. And that is God's little while. That word mikron, right over here. Right over here, mikron, a little time. A little time. That's an amazing statement. And uh, the commentaries are not necessarily agreed on what, uh, what this is all about. Some see this as a prediction uh, of special uh, knowledge that the Holy Ghost will give to Christians after Jesus uh, has been ascended into heaven. That's not the reference here at all. The Mikran, the little while, happens to be the most important moment in time. Because in this moment, this is the moment from an, uh, from an historical or earthly perspective, uh, this, this is the moment of the crucifixion, the death, the Golgotha moment of Jesus, the agony. But from the divine perspective, it's a different type of a thing. It is by, by going to the Father. This is not a reference to the ascension. Jesus goes to his father by his death. By going to his father in this little while time, he goes as the atonement, as the sacrifice for, as a sacrifice for sins. In this sense, God's Trinitarian existence comes to its full completion. And the, this activity is accompanied by, um, by contrasting and contradictory emotions. It's, um, it says here, a little while you will not see me, a little while you will see me, that's verse 19. And the emotions is, you are gonna weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. I think of the phrase, those that go, of those who sow in, in tears so shall reap, sow in tears shall weep in laughter and joy. Now that's a theme that's found throughout the in, entire Bible. And that is the saints of God suffer, but their suffering is not lost. Their suffering is productive. Their suffering is gonna be followed by something even greater. Now in the immediate context, of the passage, this is spoken within this, the day before uh, Jesus is, uh, or during the day before Jesus will be crucified. 
this is on his mind. Uh, he is very much he is very much in uh, in control of his situation. Um, his soul will be sorrowful to death unto death. It's a miserable situation. Uh, just before I came here, I learned that a well-known radio personality in Fort Wayne, who has been waiting for a kidney transplant, has has gone sour. And the man is in great distress. And I, and I am in distress for him too, because he knows what the he knows what the inevitable was going to be, but that inevitable is is the common experience of all of us, and it was the common experience of Jesus. It's not something, in one sense, he knows it's part of God's plan that by 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 his suffering he will go to the Father and thus by complete the God's uh, God's plan of obtaining righteousness and justification for all people. Uh, th that's the upper side. But the lower side is this. He has to face death. His disciples will weep, will be feared, will have fear. They will have anxiety. And they'll have anxiety for the same reason that we have anxiety when we face uh, tragedies in our lives. And that tragedy is... Uh, the tragedy is we see things from one side of life and God sees it from another. And he promises that your uh, sorrow will be turned, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Um, a good friend of ours, the late Don, Don Defner, who some of you may remember, would all to say if, it would love to say we may not be control we not we may not be in control on earth, but in heaven God is in control all at all the time. And so we look at the the great the great thing about this particular pericope from John chapter sixteen, verses twelve to twenty five, is that it combines earthly and heavenly perspectives. It provide it provides the perspective that what we see in the disappointment and the horror of life. And then it shows you what God's perspective is going to be, is that through tra tragedy and sorrow, God comes, God will accomplish his victory. Now what is remarkable is verse 21, which speaks in gyne gynecological terms. Uh, when the woman bears uh, is in birth, she has sorrow, lay pain, echiai, then because the hour has come. That's amazing. He calls the hour has come. That's fra that phrase is theologically loaded. The, the hour has come. The, uh, the time has come. Well, what does that mean, the hour or the time has come? It means the time is coming or has come in which human misery is turned into absolute elation, divine elation, complete joy, rejoicing without any thoughts. Because he says, because she bears a piety and she bears a child, and she no longer remembers the affliction because of the joy, because she has born a male child, she has born a human being. Now, it's, some people are concerned that uh, the scriptures is, male dominated well if you look at the greek over here it says it doesn't say an on air has been born it says an anthropos a human being has been born so it could be as much a girl child as it is a boy child now whether you want to bring that into a sermon that's up to you but i think it could be brought into a sermon what is amazing considering we do not know uh, who was present at the birth of a, ch of, of a child in the ancient world, how that was done. Uh, today, by the way, everybody gets in the act. I was present for the birth of only one, one son, not the other two. And um, I can't say that I remember it. I do remember it happened in Germany. And uh, as we were waiting, I was served coffee 
and um, and bread, which is and cheese, which is very nice and very strange. But how about the mother? And uh, one wonders whether Jesus himself was present at the birth of a child. Now, I'm not going to say that he was, but certainly this can be used as an illustration. Um, somehow he knows, this, this is what he knows from his own experience. The houses in the ancient world were not all that big. And um, he had to be present, seems most likely to present. He had four other brothers and at least two other sisters. And uh, there, uh, there, there had to, the room, they had to go into a big room for the birth of a child. So he, this kind of indicates that Jesus was a participant or was fully aware of the human experience. And why did Jesus use this illustration? Certainly it's, a, it's an illustration which is transcultural. I mean, there is no, there is no nat nationality, there is no culture in which, uh, the, the, which the people would not know that giving birth to a child is an agonizing experience and also a life-threatening one. It's only been recently that uh, most of the life-threatening uh, potential in the birth of a child, uh, the life of the mother being threatened by the birth, has has gone away. But the, uh, this is certainly, oh, uh, this is certainly something that can be included in a sermon that'll resonate to everybody who was there, and that is giving birth to a child is in is is given to an experience. Now, one could expect that from a woman, uh, th th this kind of illustration would come forth. But Jesus uses it. And it's really a magnificent illustration because he is speaking about death giving way to life. He is speaking about dying, being superseded by resurrection. Uh, it's amazing. And it, it's, it's very strange. He uses the womb as a as an illustration of the tomb. From the womb comes death, the potential for death, and a new life. And so from the tomb of Jesus comes the life of, of the resurrection. Um, now, when looking at this, at this particular pericope, you have an opportunity to preach on any number of things. And the only time will determine where you're going to, you know, to de uh, where you're going to devote the emphasis. I mean, as we have said already, you could devote it to uh, a, sh a short discussion or a longer one on the nature of the scriptures. Because it says of the spirit, he, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the father has is mine. And therefore, I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And that is, yes, the entire scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't even begun to touch the greatness and the mystery of what that particular book is. Because everything that is in the scriptures has its origin in the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. And the Spirit is the one that brings these things to memory. And I don't think it's uh, uh, wrong to, uh, uh, to bring this up, because it at least uh, when we speak of inspiration, we're not speaking of a magical activity. In fact, we're not speaking of an internal mystery. We're, we're not speaking of a mystical experience. We're speaking of the words that Jesus himself spoke, which are then intensified and preserved by the Holy Spirit. This also, this pericope gives you an opportunity to rehearse again Good Friday and... Uh, and Easter, the little while, can be a sermon all of itself. A little while, you will not see me, and a little while you will, and that little while where we don't see him. And that little while now, we exist in both of those terms, in both, within, both, within uh, the prior sorrow and, and the anticipation after, because we do not see Jesus now. 
and this little while is the life which we are living now, um, which will then be turned into a time when we will actually see Jesus. And then this also explains that the time that we are living in will have many difficulties. The one thing which is noteworthy about John is that he tends to repeat himself. And uh, this passage repeats the concept of a little while. It repeats the idea of Jesus getting from the Father. I think that's perfectly fine that we bring this repetitive thought again and again. And so this is this Sunday is a rehearsal of Good Friday and Easter. It is also a preparation for Trinity Sunday. And that's one of the things that, at least in my estimation, we do not give our, enough attention to in our preaching. Uh, it simply does not do to cover this topic at, uh, on Trinity Sunday. Here we have a prelude of how this can be done. I thank you very much. And in a moment or two, we will go on to the next uh, pericope, a continuation of John chapter 16.